I've always wanted to be a nurse um, from when I, as far as as I as far back as I can remember really. When I was young, I was quite a sickly child. I had really bad eczema, really bad asthma. And often I'd have to go to the hospital in the middle of the night because I would have uh, an asthma attack. I was always with my parents and my local hospital was St Thomas's just by Westminster. I felt secure, safe every time I attended the hospital. And that feeling of uh, the smell of disinfectant, I felt really safe with the staff and the nurses. And I think the seeds just were sown from there. And at home, me and my sister, my middle sister, we used to pretend that we were um, setting up a hospital in my bedroom. So we had bunk beds and we used to set up the, the hospital on the lower bunk bed. And it grew from there and I've steered my career in that direction. Although at school, I didn't pass all my O-levels and pass all my A-levels, but um, I became more academic as I began my nursing career. So that's my beginnings. I have to say my training was uh, relatively good and smooth. I was the only black girl in my set. I always wanted to go to the Middlesex Hospital. That's where I wanted to do my training. I remember driving past the Middlesex Hospital and I thought that is exactly where I want to train. And the Middlesex Hospital at that time in the 80s was very aristocratic. Um, if you were a person of colour, you didn't really get into those type of nursing schools. And, um, but I was determined and I enrolled there in 1989. Um, there was an Asian girl in my set. We all got on particularly really, really well. It was hard, like most nurse training is, it's challenging, but it was, it was good and I had fantastic mentors. There wasn't any black mentors, there wasn't many black nurses when I was training. So I looked to my, to my white mentors and they were really, really good, really good. So in terms of racism, during my training, I can't remember or recall a specific incident um, regarding discrimination. It was a very positive journey for me during my training. I, was, I am always and was always cognizant that I was the only black girl in my set. And my Asian colleague, we were very cognizant of that. So we made sure that we were together, we relied on each other because there is a sense of familiarity. And I think from the beginning, you always know that if you are a person of colour, that there are certain expectations and you know that you have to work doubly or triply hard. It's just, it's just, it's just what's, what's known and recognised. So when I started my first job, it, things were... Things were fairly smooth because there was a demand for nursing. So if you trained in your, um, your nursing school, your nursing midwifery school, you tended to stay at that, um, the hospital that was associated with the nursing school. So it was an automatic transition. I started in oncology nursing, which is cancer. And very soon I transferred over to the intensive care uh, unit because the cancer wards closed so my job was put at risk so I always knew that I wanted to go back to intensive care because during my training I absolutely loved it I'm quite dr I'm quite dramatic I'm a drama queen really uh, or an ambulance chaser as some people would say so I like the bars the adrenaline of uh, a highly a high acute area so we just um, transitioned over into the intensive care unit and I stayed in that field for nearly 20 years. So, so, I, so no matter where I am now, I, st I still say that I am a critical care nurse. That's my specialty. In terms of um, discrimination and prejudice, whenever I have experienced it, it's always been very, very subtle. That's the na that sometimes can be the nature of discriminatory behaviours, they can be very overt or they can be very subtle. And um, from patients, sometimes it is quite subtle in that they may not want you to look after them. And sometimes they may tell you that explicitly or not. Uh, sometimes it's very explicit. 
and we've we've had there's been situations where uh, a patient may say that and a, an organization worth its salt will not tolerate those type of behaviors and we several of us have been in that position and fortunately we've been in organizations where they haven't tolerated that in terms of other behaviors of discrimination it's subtle so it's subtle in you might not get the first interview that you apply for it's subtle in um, the treatments that so so there could be scenarios that you are working your way through or experiencing and when you compare them to a colleague that's not black or not asian the way that uh, that that scenario is particularly handled uh, for a person of color can be very very different and very challenging so my experience of racism has been very um it's been there but it's subtle and it's it's kind of underneath it's not as blatant um if you ask me mo most of my experience of racism and discrimination is through other people so i so many people uh come and see me or ring me or email me about their level of dis discrimination so i often encounter it at that in that in that way I think if you if you are a person of colour, um, there is something innate in you that, well, for me, this sense of responsibility when you are a person of colour around injustice. So for me, my involvement stemmed from, it, it, it's kind of always been there, but I think significant events will be um, some really um, horrible experiences that my colleagues have been through, especially I would say in in the 90s and in the 2000s. And then I got to know about the Chief Nursing Officers for England's um, Black Minority Ethnic Strategic Advisory Group. I must have come across the group um, incidentally through another colleague, and that would have been <clears throat> probably the mid 2000s, maybe the early 2000s. And for the first time, I saw or sat amongst a group of Black, predominantly Black, there were some Asian, senior nurses and midwives. I'd never come across that before ever in my career, as I mentioned earlier, because you just don't see black senior nurses and midwives. And for me, I was so inspired. Um, I was so um, just blown away by the depth and level of expertise they had. And then at those um, forums, you get to see strategically or in a, in, in a wider scope, the the degree of discrimination and racism that there is that, that staff experience. So that probably would have been my impetuous to, to really get involved in, in, that whole, in that whole landscape. I've seen many colleagues that have experienced um, discrimination and, and prejudice. It could be anything from bullying and harassment within the workplace, um, I've I've had um, staff that have um, been at the point of self harm because of the degree of bullying and harassment. I've experienced I've been in meetings where some staff have wanted to call the police due to the level of her, their behaviour, uh, to the in response to the behaviour from managers and line managers. I've been in situations where I've had to go and represent people, and some are, so so some of the examples are. For, our pe for people of colour, uh, they're not always equipped with um, knowing the ins and outs of some of the processes. So they may often go to disciplinaries or hearings informally and formally without having the proper preparation or representation. And I've seen many a times that the organisations, some of them, they kind of, um, they know this. And so because they know this and the person doesn't know what the expectation is, it leaves them in a very vulnerable position. So I've been, um, I've accompanied people to hearings or meetings where some of the allegations that they have, that the managers have presented have no factual or evidence base at all. And so if you don't go with somebody that knows the ins and outs of the processes, it leaves them in a very vulnerable position. And for people of color, uh, for black minority ethnic uh, staff, um, they can find themselves in very, very difficult circumstances that impact on their mental health and also impact on their career. So in many instances, and through COVID, that was very, very amplified.
So we've discussed some issues around racism. So some of it can be very blatant, some of, some of it can be subtle. So subtle racism, for example, would be that you walk into a room and the conversation stops. So that, that might be an example. I've been in meetings where uh, I've been excluded. So we are talking about um, particular um, uh, discussions around information and I've wanted to put my contribution forward and I've just been ignored. And then somebody else who might be junior to me is not experienced as me, uh, their contributions will be put forward instead of, instead of mine. I've been in places where they've assumed that I am not the senior nurse. Uh, they get my name wrong and they get my position wrong. So, and you have to keep on uh, repeating who you are and what your position is. So some of those are, I would say some of those are some of the subtle racisms as opposed to, um, I've been in situations where um, people will say, well, you may only be here because you're black. Or um, <laughs> sometimes people, they talk about tokenism. Um, and for people of color, we, sometimes we can't even get to tokenism because um, we are still trying to build ourselves up from, from the ground onwards. I'm from Nigerian stock. And so in terms of how, do, how does some of these behaviors make me feel, I'm very aware of the impact of these microaggressions. So sometimes for people of color, we have to be really clear with people when they are um, just demonstrating those those horrible hate behaviors to towards us and not and not allow these people to to excuse their behavior so i am a tough cookie i know that i have every right to be at the table i know that i have to work twice as hard as yvonne cockrell says to get um twice as you have to work twice as hard to get half as far so for me it makes me stronger it makes me um, have that fighting spirit. And I know that there is, uh, that we talk about failure, that failure can, kind of builds you up. And sometimes I have a, a low tolerance for failure because I've worked really hard to get here. And I have a, I have a real responsibility to bring um, the people that, that follow me to my level and beyond my level if need be. So it, it toughens me. It is, it is painful at times, but I don't let the pain drown me because I'm on a mission, so I need to be moving forward all the time. I challenge it all the time, all the time. So, so I always, so, so when I'm talking about racism and in terms of how you challenge that, it's really, really important for people to understand that when you challenge racism, it can come at a personal cost. So, so you have to be cognizant that are you, are you prepared um, to accept the cost, okay? And the cost has many different currencies. So it could be small, it could be medium, it could be large. And for junior staff, uh, so they, they might not be able to manage the cost. So you just have to weigh and balance it. So an example would be around a challenge. If anybody says to me, so I've been in organizations where sometimes the phraseology is that sometimes the black staff, they don't want to progress. And that's the reason why they don't get the post. I will always challenge that every time um, because for me, that's totally unacceptable because it's on an even playing field. I've also had people um, tell me that, um, that there is no issue with bullying and harassment. And then I might point them then to the workforce race equality standard. And I've challenged, especially during COVID, because it was very clear um, black um, Asian nurses were dying. And I challenged that on a national scale and I challenged that locally as well. So during COVID, um, that was a, um, a horrible time. So, so many people say that there was, it was a time of strength and uh, community and collaboration, but it was also a harrowing time. And in April, May, it was very clear that uh, black people, black and Asian and the ethnic communities were disproportionately impacted by COVID. And I felt at that time that the system was very slow in responding um, to those concerns. So you decide 
whether you're going to sit back and wait for the system to respond or whether you're going to challenge what the status quo was. And one of the triggers for challenging um, the, the status quo as it was is that nurses were dying. Nurses and midwives were dying. I lost a colleague, Dr. Alpha Sadu, very early. He's one of the first 10 doctors that died. And I lost my uncle the first week of April. So those are real things that, um, so, so it's one thing to care for patients. And then when your family dies, it completely rocks your world in a bad way. And what, one of the things I noticed is that the, the language around nursing midwives dying was quite low. And one of the key things for me was around the risk assessments. The, so risk assessments were coming into play to assess the level of risk. And I was quite incensed because when the first risk assessments came out, there was no reference to uh, black, ethnic, Asian minority communities at all. And we knew then in April and May, there were two um, particular studies, the Office of National Statistics and the Institute of Fiscal Studies that clearly showed the disproportionate impact on um, black Asian uh, communities. So it wasn't there. So we challenged. And the, one of the reasons how we challenge is that we um, looked at the, the organisations. I raised it within my local organisation and I raised it with um, the Chief Nursing Officer uh, of England and the local groups. And so we started to uh, raise the discourse and the dialogue about ensuring that um, protocols, policies were fit for purpose and reflected um, the impact on ethnic communities. So that's one of the biggest challenges. There have been other things around raising the voices of uh, black and minority ethnic nurses as well. Um, so lots of things. I think the re response was a bit slow in the beginning, but it, it did take off. And then we started to see the system to respond. So the Faculty of Occupational uh, Medicine, they produced a national risk assessment that clearly reflected um, the issues around ethnicity. And then all trust and organisations started to amend their local risk assessments to reflect ethnicity. I got a lot of calls and a lot of correspondence asking, what does a, a good risk assessment tool look like? So we needed to, we shared some of our own, and then we also gave out advice around what risk assessments should contain in relation to ethnicity. And within my organisation, lots of nurses were ringing me and contacting me saying, Felicia, you know, I, you know, I, I'm unsure, I'm not right. And then nationally, we had a lot of calls. And that's where we did a lot of our work nationally because lots of nurses and midwives were calling us to say that they were frightened and they were scared. So we had to give out a lot of advice. Sometimes I've had to contact another organisation to say, this is what's coming out of your organisation, that this needs to be sorted out. So those are some of the pieces of work that we've done. I, I, and I say we, because this work is not done on your own, it's done with in collaboration and with teams. Sure. I heard, first heard about COVID in December, actually. In December, we knew that the first cases were emerging from China. And I was particularly struck by one of the doctors in China that had first raised the alarm and he died. And then the WHO had declared a national emergency fairly early in 2020. And I was in Bangladesh. Um, we were on a charity mission, uh, myself and some colleagues, visiting some student nurses. So that was in February. And then in March, uh, I, came, I came back at the end of February. And then within my local hospital, um, we started to get an increase in cases between February and March. And then all the um, hospitals and various organisations started to go into preparation mode. And so as a healthcare worker, um, you had to prepare for COVID because at that time it was still new and emerging and it was a new virus. So there was still a lot of unknowns. So I think for me, um, I manage lots of teams. So I have two hats. I have my own um, organisation and manage my teams there. And then I have the Chief Nursing Officers um, BME Strategic Advisory Group. So I have two hats on because a lot of nurses um, from the ethnic communities were quite anxious at the time. I have to say the whole system was scared. 
I'd seen lots of doctors, nurses, um, midwives, the whole healthcare family were quite terrified. Um, I don't know if I don't know if it's out there, but it was it was a very uh, scary time because we were dealing with the unknown, and so um, we were we were we were working through the pandemic, and then I remember um, the news started emerging around the impact on uh, communities and people of colour, and I mentioned earlier those two particular reports, and I remember looking at an article, it must have been in the Times or the Guardian. And I looked at the faces of um, the images of the staff and maybe out, maybe five or six were, were white. The rest were all black or Asian. And then we started hearing that the first 10 doctors who died from COVID were black and Asian. One of them was my colleague. Then we had the two seminal reports. And then I remember, so the, the information wasn't very transparent about who was dying and the numbers of staff who were dying. And I did my own count and I made my own list. And I had a list around April or May of 200 staff that had died. And then I looked at the nurses and I counted over 70 nurses and barring three, they were all black, Asian nurses and midwives. So I remember sitting there and I thought, this is not, this is not good and this is very worrying. But there was no clamoring from the system. There was no clamoring from the nursing midwifery mid communities, to be honest. And then we started getting calls. So although we're known um, as a, an advisory group, we actually started getting calls and nurses were telling us that they were absolutely terrified. I have to say within my local trust, we were quite well set up. We had enough equipment. We had enough masks. Um, there was an openness and transparency because a lot of um, a lot of our staff within my organisation are from ethnic backgrounds. So we needed, we, we realised then that we need to do something very, very quickly for nurses across the country. And um, part of that led us to um, setting up a series of engagement events across the country. And we met with um, nearly 2,000 nurses and midwives. And we did this virtually online because we couldn't, we couldn't meet with them because nobody could travel. And we met with them and we also, um, so we had these engagement events were set up with a panel of speakers to try and generate the discussion. And then we had an open floor where the nursing staff could tell us um, what was going on. And I have to say, quite harrowing, very harrowing. I was fairly assured within my own trust that we were rigorous, even though there was lots of fear and anxiety, that there were lots of protocols that kept staff safe. That's where I work. However, elsewhere, it wasn't like that at all. And if you were in the nursing home, it was dire because they just they didn't have any PPE at all. So um, during these telephone conferences, we ran them between April and May. And uh, staff were telling us some key things. They told us that they, if you were black or Asian or ethnic, you were being asked to go by your by your line manager into areas where there were lots more COVID patients. And so when they looked at that and they looked at their white colleagues, there was a there was a um there was a disproportionate allocation of them into COVID areas. They told us they were dying. There was a protocol that said from the Royal College of Obstetricians that if you were 28 weeks pregnant, that you had to automatically go on maternity leave. Lots of especially Filipino nurses told us that the line managers were ignoring that rule and that they were being asked to continue to work. We had lots of distressed staff on the telephone calls. So sometimes we had to stop the meeting and counsel them because they were so distressed. We heard that uh, they couldn't, staff couldn't get access to testing. Um, that there was lots of misinformation, mythology out there. There were lots of staff asking us whether the vitamin D was working or not. Lots of staff told us about the face masks, that they didn't fit. Um, and that's when we started to, to, to note the emerging evidence around uh, if you were uh, the, the mask, uh, the mask, the FFP3 mask, were designed around white male Caucasian faces. So if you had smaller nose, smaller jaw, the FFP3 didn't fit you very well. So this was the kind of themes that were coming out from the um, uh, from the the engagement events. 
So we did, I think we carried out, I think about eight, eight or nine sessions. And then after that, we had to sit down as a group and collate all the information. So when we collated the information, we then uh, drafted recommendations and then we submitted that into a report to the Chief Nursing Officer for England so that they could be absolutely clear uh, um, that this is what the concerns are. This is the reality of the lived experience of black and Asian and ethnic nurses and midwives. This is what they're experiencing. And we had to do something drastic about that. So that piece of work fed into informed a national plan to improve the health and safety of black, Asian and ethnic nurses and midwives. So it's a seminal piece of work. What does one feel when you're in the middle of a pandemic? And what does one feel when it's clear that nurses that look like you, <clears throat> as a black and Asian healthcare, a healthcare worker, are experiencing some really harrowing um, experiences and times? I, I still feel absolutely scandalous and scandalized that nurses died in high numbers and actually, the, the amount of nurses that died during this pandemic were, are higher than the First World War. How, how can that be? I, I'm still, I won't say gobsmacked, I just find it absolutely scandalous and disgraceful. I find it disgraceful that the voices of those nurses and midwives are still not heard. I find it disgraceful that nurses and midwives are still dying. So in February of this year, <clears throat> 10 nurses died seven of them were black and Asian. In particularly, the Filipino communities have died in terms of nurses in really high numbers. I and a lot of my colleagues were quite, we're still traumatized. We're still traumatized. And I worry about the profession in that we've been through two waves now. And so a third wave might come in August or September this year, 2021. And we are all trying to recharge <clears throat> and cope with the pace of um, recovery and restoration of of going through a global pandemic so we can breathe a bit now but I was at, I was at church the other day and I became very tearful and I realized that the trauma is just sitting underneath and I am one of many that our trauma just sits underneath because we've had to do things that we haven't done before there is a degree of moral injury. So, um, you know, nurses want to do their best. Nurses and midwives want to do their absolute best. And when you feel that you can't do that, that weighs heavily on your mind. I feel a sense of responsibility of carrying my profession and carrying all those black and Asian and ethnic communities. I, I, it weighs heavily on me. So um, in after the first wave, I didn't sleep for four to five months. Um, I just couldn't sleep and many of us couldn't sleep because the things are just churning in your mind. The rate of death was really quick. You turn your back and the patient had died. It was that fast for some of the patients and a lot of my nurses and they, they were traumatised by that. We're, we're used to death. We are used to caring for patients because that's what we're here to do. But the pace was really, really fast. So a lot of us, and I say us, as the nursing and midwifery family, we're traumatised. So we function, of course we do, and I think there's been a lot of um, resources and support um, put in to, to helping us, but we're traumatised. I still feel traumatised, but we function. Yeah, we function, we do our best, um, but it's, uh, it's, been, it's been quite harrowing. I think the things that have got, us, got me through and my colleagues through is that sense of teamwork, um, we prayed long, we prayed hard, we, um, the chaplaincies were just fantastic and we needed that. I think if you're in a good structured organisation, you've got good chief nurses, good chief executives and the rest of the teams, it makes a difference because they are, you know, they've got your back. But for many of my colleagues and many of people, many nurses and midwives I don't know, they didn't have that. Um, and they are still dying and that is not acceptable and we don't have the transparency to know the numbers. We think the numbers, so we know, well approximately we would say that uh, 3,000 nurses and midwives have died globally. I think, I think it's much more here in this country 
probably several hundreds and probably maybe 200 nurses and midwives have died. We're still not talking about it. It's not in the public discourse, the amount of nurses and midwives that have died and specifically black, Asian and ethnic minority nurses and midwives died. So that weighs heavily on me and that's how I feel. So especially in the first wave, um, because COVID was new, a lot of us were watching the news constantly, looking at the figures, looking at which parts of the country and globally where the COVID was worse. And a lot of us became quite consumed by looking at the data. And it wasn't until later on that I realised that all that data just keeps on replaying, replaying in your head. So when I would finish work, so you're immersed in COVID at work and then you come home, it was like a, a recorder that just kept on playing and playing. So I go to sleep thinking of COVID, I dream of COVID and I wake up thinking of COVID, thinking about the next day. So, so you're, just, you're just running on batteries and you just find that your body doesn't shut down and doesn't rest and it doesn't recover and you're just on an automatic clock that just keeps on going and going and going so you 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 do work through that but you're just not rested so a lot of us put on we actually put on weight a lot of us did and uh, you just we, you know your cortisol is going up but you, you can't measure it but you definitely know that your cortisol is growing up and you feel you feel some of that tension that holds your body so that lack of sleep it was just um, after a while you just you just feel anxious you just feel anxious all the time so for me and I I don't sleep very well anyway so you can imagine that on top is just oh, I can't escape I think that's the feeling was you know I can't escape from this so in my role although I'm managing uh, um, a division I for me, part of my credibility is making sure that I'm a hands-on and I'm an intensive care unit nurse by, by background. So especially in the second wave, I was just basically on the floor. So I spent a lot of time on the wards because we had loads of patients. So a lot of our wards uh, converted to COVID, COVID wards and the staff were, were, were exhausted, <laughs> just been through a first wave. And then the second wave came fast and furious. So I spent between no, December and March uh, basically on the wards. So most of us didn't stay in the offices. We were out there working clinically and supporting our staff. And so what do you do? You have to rally. You have to rally your staff. You have to comfort them. You can't hug them when they're tearful and distressed because you're meant to um, be socially distanced. But we found we catalogue. I did catalogue some of our experience. So I, I took pictures at the time as well. And we tweeted as well, just so that people could see what we were going through. Um, it was exhausting. We worked many, many hours. So 12 hour days, Monday to Friday, coming in at the weekends just to make sure all the staff were okay. And the, the death and the dying of patients so quickly and rapidly, that, that takes a toll. And I, and I think if you ask most nurses and midwives, that is one of the key stresses. When you're nursing in tough times, <clears throat> there, are, there are many things. I think there are, there are many uh, stories, there are many accounts of care that are memorable in your whole career. For me, during COVID, uh, there would be a few. There, I remember one particular evening, it was an evening shift, and I was um, out on the wards. And what we found during the COVID was that a lot of nurses had to be redeployed to other areas that they don't normally work. And there, there is this issue of moral injury. So when you are asked to do things that you, you don't normally do. And I remember it was a paediatric nurse and she was nursing in the adult ward. And she was very, very distressed. And the nurses and the patients were really, really sick. She couldn't cope. And I remember trying to console her and I just couldn't console her. And so she had to then take some quiet time away. And I, there were a lot of patients that were just really, really sick. And I said to myself, well, I've got to care for all these patients and I need the help. So I thought, just got to get on with it and try and nurse these patients as best as you can on my own. 
because that's what you had to do. So sometimes you know that you're not giving your best care, but what you're giving has to be the best you can do in really difficult circumstances. Um, other things are, it's just the sheer fatigue and the exhaustion when sometimes you feel that you can't go on anymore. During the first wave, I lost my uncle, um, just uh, nearly broke me because sometimes as a nurse, you might think you're a bit of a superhero because you're in the care, caring profession. I think what's really good is that nurses, nurses and midwives were seen like that. But when you are caring for the sick and the dying, and then it happens to you, it took me, it completely rocked me. I was, I just didn't know where I was for, for I, just didn't, I just didn't know where I was. And I just didn't even know how to think, how to feel. And yet I had to go back to work and function. So that really shook me. And I'm a, I'm a Christian woman, so I have faith, but I just didn't know what to do then. I, that really shook me. Other things that shook me were in the second wave. Um, I remember a week in February, uh, nine, nine or 10 nurses died. And I have to say, I was really, really hesitant to take the vaccine. You will know that there was lots of hesitation amongst com ethnic communities. And there was a there was a lots of news made about um, hesitancy, but actually there were lots of other communities that were also hesitant about the vaccine, not just ethnic communities. So I was hesitant for a number of reasons, and I remember in that first week of February, those ten nurses dying, and seven of them were from ethnic communities. And I said to myself, you know what, Felicia, take the vaccine, just take the vaccine. I have a mum who's in her seventies. I have family responsibilities and I don't want to be um, part of, I just don't want to be a, a nurse or a midwife that, that dies and be part of that. It's distressing enough and I just, I just didn't want to do that. And it reminds you of your own mortality when you're amongst that. So I just took my vaccine and, um, and, and I still think um, I'm still sitting here, still standing here, still being able to work and I didn't catch COVID. And I was immersed in COVID. Like many of our colleagues, we were immersed in COVID. And many staff got COVID, many staff. And I sometimes I still find it unbelievable by why we're not talking about this. Many healthcare staff got COVID, many nurses and midwives got COVID, many staff died from COVID. So I'm very, very grateful to be sitting here So in terms of workplace safety, one of the, one of the big things was around uh, PPE equipment. It was, it, it was clear in the first wave that there was insufficient PPE equipment nationally, though some organizations had sufficient supplies. So for me, it's really important that that should have been standardized across the whole country, across the different settings, that there should have been sufficient PPE. And actually, there should have been real strong efforts that if the PPE was in, insufficient, that staff were properly risk assessed. And so where, whatever setting, whatever industry, as a healthcare worker, the, the issues around staff protection should have been first and foremost, and it wasn't. So your level and degree of perfection, uh, your level and degree of uh, protection, if you are a healthcare worker, was very varied depending on the industry and depending on where you were within the country. So that should have been absolutely paramount. I think also that clearly when the concerns were raised around the disproportionate impact of COVID on ethnic communities, that should have really been nationally uh, recognised by the government and really stringent efforts made um, to protect um, those, uh, those, those groups of staff. So a lot of groups of staff were asking us that um, should they even be exposed to COVID uh, patients and communities if you're from an ethnic background? And a number of organisations said no. So that caused real increased anxiety amongst um, staff from ethnic communities. And I think uh, organisations should have really engaged with their ethnic staff much, much earlier to address those kind of concerns. Those are some of the things that were really 
key for me and that this and that we should have been checking we should have been measuring we should have been tracking numbers and i think we should have been engaging with the healthcare workers much much earlier those are the key key things for me because increased um contact with covid patients means increased viral load can increase increase your viral load So PPE was a, a real worry um, and a lot of staff uh, told us about their, their anxiety around the lack of PPE. So what did we see? We saw people wearing two hats. We saw um, people wearing double masking because they, was just, they were scared. Um, we saw people very frightened and anxious about the, the guidance because in wave one, the guidance kept on changing. So we saw a lot of staff that were absolutely terrified. I think if you were in a hospital, I think staff felt much more safe because it, you have more of a structure. But if you're working in a um, nursing home or residential home, it was completely, completely different. Staff felt very, they told us this, they felt very exposed. They had no aprons, no gowns to wear. But because their heart is in the right place and they knew they've got to care for patients, they did, they went to care for the patients anyway, putting themselves at risk. We've also heard accounts that because staff uh, got COVID, that they've been excluded from their families. So this is, this is real, this is real um, sadness and tragedy that, you know, staff were excluded from their families. F families found it very, very hard to cope with you if you were a healthcare worker as well in some circumstances, because they felt that if you were a healthcare worker, you'd bring COVID into the family home. So we heard some really, really harrowing stories. We heard stories where some managers would hide the PPE from staff. These were, these were black and Asian staff telling us this, that if you were going on towards, that actually the managers were hiding the PPE. What, what do you do in those circumstances? And then the managers are still expecting you to go and work. They also, and if you were an agency nurse, the agency nurses told us that it was particularly harrowing because they weren't recognised. And so they felt that they didn't have any rights. So sometimes they couldn't ask for PPE because they felt if they were not part of the permanent workforce, they didn't have any rights. So these are some of the real stories and accounts that staff were telling us. They were terrified. They were, they were, they were absolutely terrified at times. So during the pandemic, especially in wave one, we had many staff that told us that um, they were they felt unduly pressured um, to to go into those COVID areas, whether they were in nursing homes, whether in hospitals. We heard also accounts that staff said that uh, they were being threatened with their work permits to be revoked during that time as well. We had several of those, and several of the staff said that they couldn't challenge the decision. Because if they challenge a decision, they will be faced with disciplinary, bullying, harassment, um, lots of other HR uh, processes. So that was a very real experience, lived experience for some of the staff. And the staff felt a pressure that if they didn't go into some of those areas as well, that um, they would have a poor appraisal, um, that they um, their career progression also would be impacted. So that, that was very, very real. And several staff told us that. I was always um, uh, told and informed when I did my own research that we wouldn't expect those, those vaccines to be ready for about a year and a half. And so suddenly when the vaccine were ready uh, towards the, the, the latter end of 2020, I was, a bit, I was a bit concerned because I'd understood that it, it took time to um, produce vaccines. There's also a history of um, a history of uh, ethnic communities have been involved with medication trials that haven't gone well, there have been abuses, they haven't received the right level of information. And there's a general distrust. We see that with organ donation, bone marrow, transplant, bone marrow transplantation of ethnic communities hesitancy. So I think as an individual, you always have the right to say uh, what goes into your body. 
and the evidence base for the vaccine at the time is, was still emerging. Um, it's still new discoveries were still happening. So it took us time to actually read through that level of information. So I was hesitant. I, I knew that I would probably need to take the vaccine, um, but the, the the timeline for taking the vaccine, I was just I just wanted to make sure that I had a real informed decision and I didn't feel pressured by it. There was also something about, um, we were feeling pressure that as healthcare professionals, we had a kind of a moral ethical duty about taking the vaccine. But we as healthcare professionals, we know what ethical and moral uh, duty is. We know that because we're in the profession. So for me, it was really important for me to understood understand all the theory, all the evidence base, and to make an informed decision um, based on that. And in the end, I made the decision to take the vaccine because I'd done my research, my um, my uh, history, <laughs> if, if you like. I'd spoken to my priest, I'd spoken to my local virologist. And then you look at what's happening around you and you're working in a COVID, um, you're working in a COVID environment. And I have to say, once again, that having nurses and midwives die in high numbers was really was really the thing that cemented it for me. Many healthcare workers were conflicted and hesitant about the vaccine. I think most of it was around the newness, but there was also lots of mythology, um, all these controversial theories, lots of uh, news stories on Twitter and on YouTube. So there were lots of conspiracy theories as well. I think also one of the key things for me is that if the system had made, um, had paid more attention to the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on ethnic communities, if they were, if they paid much more attention, put some real tangible actions in in the first wave, um, that may have impacted on the level of death and uh, contracting the COVID as they have done with the vaccination, I think we might have been having a very different level of conversation because we would have built up a lot more trust. There would have been a lot more evidence base out there and the system needed to do a lot more preparation. I think it's very clear that ethnic communities have that degree of mistrust with some of um, these processes and protocols. So you needed to have put an effort in fairly early. We knew that we were developing the vaccine, so it should have started maybe September, October, November, December. Blam, the, the vaccine came in December and suddenly people were expected to take it. But it's new. And so because of the newness, you need to build up a good level of um, trust and you need to work with your communities, especially when it's clear that certain ethnic communities were anxious. And so that cannot be just ruled out as simply saying that, um, you know, we have hesitancy for no reason. There is genuine fear and there's genuine anxiety and we need to, uh, communities need to work through that. So, so people are still hesitant now, but what we've seen is with the engagement with communities, the hesitancy numbers have started to fall and we're starting to see that ethnic communities are um, starting to uh, take the vaccine, but it's still there. And I, I don't think anybody should just rule out the fears and anxieties that certain communities have about the vaccine. We have heard some records and some incidences of staff feeling pressured, um, be it black and minority ethnic staff feeling pressured to take the vaccine in some organisations. I think what's what's good is that it hasn't been made mandatory. And I think, you know, staff should should have the opportunity to make a really informed decision. So uh, what, what's been good is that Simon Stevens, um, the chief executive of the NHS, has been very clear that it's, it's not mandated and that what he would like to see is for staff to voluntarily uh, take the, um, the vaccine. So when we've heard those records and those reports from staff, we've been very clear to support staff to go back to their organisations to say that they shouldn't feel pressured, that they need to have the right level of information, and that sometimes we've had to step in and support staff, um, um, you know, at, at local meetings. But generally, because it's not ma mandated, there is a pressure, but I think we've, we've been very clear as a group that it's not mandated, just make sure that you've got the right level of information. We've done a lot of work 
with our nursing and midwifery colleagues to, to support them to make that best decision. Wave one was a clear mark in the sand because of uh, the insufficient uh, PPE. It, it was, that was very clear in wave one. I think that um, in terms of, if you ask me personally, um, within my organisation, it's been good. So the practice has been good. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on my personal experience because, because for many others, it hasn't been good. And so the government has a real responsibility to make sure that healthcare workers are protected and safe. And that if we're having a third wave, they need to make sure that everything um, is in place to guarantee our safety. That's absolutely clear. I think what's not been great has been the issue of pay, okay, for, for, for staff and um, the recognition of our, the part that we've played. So it's, so it's okay to say thank you and it's okay to acknowledge that the toll that it's taken. But when then the profession has a pay review and then the pay review comes out as 1%, that has, and, and we're struggling with nursing midwifery numbers, and we're struggling to retain um, staff in the midst of a, a global pandemic, uh, that has just been very, very disheartening and very, very disappointing. So what, do, what, do, what does the clapping um, signify? I think, well, it was started by a nurse, I think in Europe, um, somewhere in Scandinavia. And at the, at the beginning, I think that, that, lifted us, that lifted, lifted us up. So I can remember being sometimes coming in at home and then my neighbours would be clapping. And I think that, did a, that, that was a real boost for us. I think so, because for many years, we've been trying to raise a profession of nurses and midwives within this country and, and globally. And yet sometimes we're seen as the, we're not seen as, as sometimes we're not seen as a profession and, with that, and people have a different view of the caring profession. So I think it, it highlighted the impact of uh, the profession um, during a global pandemic. And it certainly highlighted the role of nurses and midwives like it's never done before. So it has a, a part to play. I think when you're exhausted, the clapping gets you to a point um, but 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 when you're absolutely exhausted, sometimes you might you might not hear that. So I think I think it was a real morale booster right at the beginning, definitely without without a doubt. If you are a healthcare worker, you trust you, the, the the government of your country to put your best interests at heart and to keep you safe, okay? And put processes and policies and protocols and guidance in place to keep you safe within your working environment. I have to say, and many of my colleagues would say that, that that constant changing of the PPE guidance, whether to wear a blue face mask, whether to wear PPE, whether to wear a gown in certain circumstances, because it kept on changing, it caused a lot of instability in the level of confidence that staff placed in the use of PPE and the government at that time. So there was a lot of anxiety and there was a lot of fear. So what you found staff doing is that although um, the organisation laid down a particular policy or protocol, sometimes they didn't follow it. So save, so I'll give you an example, you may only need to wear a, a blue mask in um, uh, an area where there were not, were, where there wasn't any aerosol generating procedures. So say a patient that had a respiratory infection that was low level, you'd only need to wear the blue face mask. What we found is that staff didn't trust the blue face mask and that they would automatically go to an FFPP3 because they just didn't feel safe. They didn't trust that the guidance was keeping them safe and well and free from harm. So the, I think that was one of the key things, especially in wave one, is the level of frustration and fear and distrust because that guidance kept on changing. And I think if you were on a ward, you felt that even more keenly because within the critical care and intensive care areas, they all wore FFP3 gowns, visors and everything else. If you're on the ward, you didn't always have that level of PPE. So a very different 
classification for PPE and a constantly changing guidance of PPE that caused a lot of instability and a lot of fear. And I would say that across the healthcare profession, not just nurses and midwives, doctors, domestics, therapists, it was across the whole range of disciplines. Any employer has the duty and responsibility to safeguard its um, employees. And when you're working in a global pandemic and there is a recognition that a person, a member of staff might um, contract the disease and also die, then there are stimulation, stipulations about um, benefits for the family when a member of staff dies. So I actually think it was very good um, that it was very clear about death in service benefit and, and, and the amount, I can't comment on the amount because the amount is the, what the amount the government um, uh, designates as what it is, it seems fitting and appropriate. So I, I felt that was quite good. And I felt a lot of families felt that at least they, they, they would have that. So that is good that the process is there. What in the reality is that a number of families told us that they were struggling to get, um, get hold of the benefit um, and that there was a very lengthy and protracted process to get the benefit. So it didn't happen for everybody, but for certain, and many of the um, families told us that they struggled to get the benefit. So it's a bit, um, it is a bit of contradictory when the government says the benefits here, um, it's accessible to you, and yet trying to access the benefit can be very, very complicated, and that, that causes more distress. And I think the government has a responsibility to make sure that that process is as smooth as possible. And families still now, until today, are still struggling to access the benefit. Sometimes it's the whole forms. Um, sometimes if people can't, um, they may have been here for a number of years and maybe they're in the process of getting their citizenship. So there's some, sometimes there are some of the, the official paperwork that, that, that has impacted doing all the forms, making sure that the paperwork and all the details are processed in there. Sometimes people don't understand those forms and they don't have anybody else to help them through. So that can stall the process as well. And just accessing the whole the whole system uh, of obtaining the grant can be fraught with difficulty. So it is not always a smooth process. I've also heard accounts where um, families have been asked to prove that their loved one has died from COVID-19. And so that can be challenging when it's quite clear that they have, and yet some of employ some employing authorities have made that quite difficult. And I think that that's unacceptable when it when the evidence points to the healthcare worker die actually dying from COVID nineteen. That causes a whole level new level of distress and anxiety, and um, for the families left behind. And I think we must do all we can to support them so that they can obtain that benefit. The death of George Floyd, May the 25th, now coming up to the year's anniversary, it distressed a lot of us. Um, I can remember a lot of us being very, very tearful about his death and uh, a level of anxi anxiety, a level of um, anger, a level of frustration, a level of how many more uh, black people and black men can they kill? Um, a level of surprise because actually many uh, black people are killed and murdered um, unjustly and we, we it's never captured so it's so it's done behind the scenes in a cell in a mental health institution we never see it and here we saw in broad daylight the murder of a uh, a black man in the public and that image went globally and for me, it was a turning point about the discourse and the level of conversation and dialogue that we as a nation have around race and globally, um, the discourse around race and race discrimination. And I felt, and I still feel, it's an opportunity for us to try and get things right, try and get things better for people, for communities, for healthcare workers, so that we can kind of triangulate his, George Lloyd's death, 
the issue about health inequalities, and then the issue around uh, discrimination and the, 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 the continuous problem of black and Asian and ethnic staff trying to go up the career ladder. I think it was a seminal piece and a, and a, a stop clock uh, moment for us to talk about racism, what it physically means, and then what it means for in the heart of people and how privilege plays a part in the heart of people and societies and how structures are set in motion so that uh, oppression is the rule of law in terms of keeping communities where they are um, and, the, and the way privilege plays in that. So I remember the issue around the statues and being pulled down of the historic uh, uh, English aristocracy um, who had a, a part to play in um, slavery and oppression. And we'd, we'd never, we'd, you would never see that. Even in the history of slavery, you would just never see that. And it gave a voice to people to say that what they would tolerate and what they wouldn't tolerate. Uh, within my hospital, we had a dialogue about that. I remember speaking to my um, chief executive uh, around issues around um, black and minority ethnic staff. And there was lots of dialogue um, occurring across uh, the profession. So at my in my local hospital we did a uh, we did a bend the knee, and uh, we did that uh, I think within a couple of weeks of of George Floyd's uh, murder, and we did that across outside of the hospital, and even the uh, my chief nurse and my director of nursing want you know wanted to be there to take to take part in that, and we got filmed and we tweeted it. So I think it gave um, it it gave I think it added to the permission of protest. At peaceful protests. We saw the protests across London, and it just raised it just raised the voice. And I, I I think we shouldn't wait. We shouldn't squander this moment because we need to kind of really address the injustices that people have and go through, you know, every day of their life. So and and I remember looking at that uh, George Floyd's murder, and then we had Breonna Taylor, um, the the ambulance uh, the healthcare worker that that was shot in her in her apartment. And, and often when these things happen, I feel quite tearful at times when those things happen because I just, it's just that sense of injustice, you know, a life lost, a life taken away prematurely. And it's, in a, it's an inequality. And that, that happens across our communities and it happens, it happens in, in the workplace for so many of us. So I, th I think for some people, it really gave them the ammunition to, to have that that voice, yeah, within their within their community and within their workplace, and you know, have a voice. So, so, so we say that you know, we we say that discrimination obviously um, is is um, is responsible for a lot of problems and a lot of prejudicial behaviours, but also it, it informs. So it should inform allies and it should inform the white community of you know injustices and how they can help and also support uh, the movement as well. The issue of racism within NHS has definitely got worse. I would say that because I looked at the staff survey from 2020. I think the report came out in February, March, and um, we have nine protected characteristics. So that includes um, race, includes gender, sexual orientation, age, etc., etc. And I looked at um, the issue of race, the, the, the race um, standard, and it has worsened. So staff are citing that out of all the nine protected characteristics, racial discrimination is their worst experience. And then I looked at the figure from 2019 to 2020 and it has worsened um, in terms of a, an increased percentage. So that, that's, that's a beacon, that's a mark in the sand that clearly tells you that the lived experience for staff is that discrimination, racial discrimination has worsened. Uh, we have the workforce race equality standard that still tells us that the experience for black minority and ethnic uh, staff uh, hasn't changed much even in since the inception of the res so there's still an issue of bullying and harassment still an issue of the short the discrepancy with sh um with shortlisting so it is uh, up front and center so i think anybody that tells you that discrimination is um is reduced and uh, we were all frothing at the mouth when that um, the commission from race for race 
and health inequalities, the report that came out not long ago, we were absolutely steaming with anger and uh, distress and disappointment with that report came out because it's clear um, that you, if you are a, a member of the black, Asian and ethnic community, the res is very clear, it tells you that your, um, your opportunity for rising up the career ladder is dented and decreased if you are a person of colour. And you can clearly see where, peop where staff of colour are uh, congregated. They're congregated in bands one to four, one to five, and in particular clustered in band five. So discrimination is live and kicking. Well, I've had a couple of hindrances, but I've been able to um, escalate up the career ladder. I am, um, most of that is around my background. Uh, my dad was very strict, he's a disciplinarian. So I always knew that I had to strive to be the best and I have to be able to manage and address any failures. I think the things that have really helped me in my career is that I had managers that understood the issues around race. And I had managers and mentors that understood talent and allowed me to flourish. And I say allowed me because there is a thing about permission, okay? Because sometimes the system does not allow you um, to rise. So as I progressed through my career, I had white mentors. I had a white chief nurse, uh, called Louise Bowden. She was phenomenal. She made me, she formed me because we would have discussions about race. Um, I spent a lot of time with her and she understood my talent and just cultured it and wouldn't allow me to rest on my laurels. Um, there were no black and Asian directors of nursing in my time. So I couldn't look around to see who I could emulate because they weren't there. We didn't even know about Mary Seacole until late, later on in a, a number of our careers. And then when we uh, discovered Mary Seacole, we held her, <laughs> we held her very close and that's who we could aspire to. So I am, I'm very fortunate that, you know, I've progressed up the ladder. Whenever I've failed an interview, I've just had people around me to take me through those interviews again and boost me and nurture me and move me up. So my story is quite remarkable because it, it's, it's been an upward trajectory. It's very rare. I'm just, it's just very, very rare. Sometimes it's about being in the right place at the right time. Some of it is that I've been headhunted um, and some of it is about um, not losing your authenticity. So whenever I've been in an organization or in a department, I celebrate my blackness. So if I'm the only person there, or there's two or three of us, I celebrate the blackness and we tend to um, work together and feed off each other and support each other. Because if you don't, there's not, you know, the others might not look out for you. So it's really important for me that when I see my black or Asian colleagues, that sometimes it's an insensible thing. You just make that connection because you're in the same boat, you understand the same pressures. So it's important for me to um, have really good peer support and to deliver. So I'm very, I'm very clear that when I step into a room and I'm the only person there, that I, I, it, it's not just about not failing, I've just got to be able to deliver all the time. I have to deliver above 100%. It's just innate in me because I don't want anybody to have the excuse to, to pull me up about anything. I just need to ensure that I deliver because I'm conscious I'm the only black one there. So for that fact, I'm going to stand out in a room or in a meeting. So I have all everything in a row. I have that report done. Um, for me, it's important that when I'm in an organisation, I understand where the power base is. So know who my chief nurse is, chief executive, and get to know them and they get to know me. And I can cause tension in the organisation, so I'm happy to do that. Not just in my organisation, but many, but because I've done my preparation, I've, I've done my evidence base, I've searched, I've aligned, my, aligned myself to certain people. So that's how I try and stay on top, is making sure that, you know, I'm on track um, and I've done, my, I've done my homework. I've been nursing for nearly 32 years now. 
The best job, I would say, is when I was a matron at UCLH at the Heart Hospital. I loved every single minute of it um, because I had, it's my own hospital. Uh, the team were absolutely fantastic. It was my first senior nursing post. And so that comes with a level, a lot of responsibility, but the teamwork was amazing. Um, we led services, um, cardiac services across the whole trust. And the, the heart hospital at the time was like a beacon of fantastic practice. And, um, the, you know, it was just a sense of community. I think we've got such big hospitals now and organisations, you lose that sense of community. So because it was one site, there was a great sense of community. We we're all geared up towards looking after patients and giving the best care that we can. Um, so for me, that was, you know, being a matron, you know, I, I just love it. You know, when the patients, you go around and they say, who are you? And you say, you're the matron. And you can just see the patients, they just have that sigh of, it's the matron, everything's, <laughs> everything's going to be fine. So that, that has a real sense of pride for me. Uh, another pr uh, proud moment was when I got the OBE uh, last year. Um, and, and even beside that, I have, I have many proud moments that might seem simple to some people when you are mentoring somebody and then they get that job. They are, they are, they are proud moments for me. So there's, you know, there's all of those uh, moments that boost you up and just give you a sense of real satisfaction. But the, the OBE was a, a, a real sense of celebration. It was kind of difficult because I was in quarantine <laughs> during when I, when I got it. I'd just come back from holiday. Um, so it was a um, that that is a that's probably a pinnacle for me. But I say this about the OBE that although it's a very very proud moment for me, it came at a cost, and the cost was that lots of nurses died, lots of nurses and midwives died, especially from Black minority ethnic communities. So the OBE is not just for them, not just for me. It's for them. Um, that that's what it to me. That's exactly what it's about. It's for them. And the work that we did, and I say we, I always say we, because it was a team effort with the group and the regional leads, is that it came at a cost, okay? And um, I, just, I just hope and pray that we don't go through that again. So tackling racism in the NHS. It's not, it's not a one size fits all, and I, I don't really have a golden solution um, to the problem, because one of the, the central uh, ethos is, is about hearts and minds, and it's about people that have privilege and cultures that have privilege that exist at the expense of others. And that's a fundamental issue, is that how racism plays a part is that it oppresses. And so it leaves the, some of the people in power and the systems in power, um, they remain where they are because, because racism flourishes. So it's not a one size fits all. I think for me, it's about ensuring, so there's lots of diversity with the NHS, but there's not a lot of equity. So for me, it is around the issue of racism is ensuring that there is a level playing field, regardless of what your racial and ethnic background would be. Um, I would I would say that there's also a place for um, uh, for positive action. I would say that um, that the issues of racial discrimination should be written into the board assurance frameworks of organisations, and that there is a uh, a cultural and a physical um, uh, demonstration of implementation of those policies and processes that actually make a difference to people's lives, that they feel it, that they tell you um, that it's that's a lived experience. So when you're measuring whether you are making an impact in terms of racial um, equity, that actually it's the people that inform the organisation that what they are doing has made a change. And for me, a lot of that comes at the leadership level so that the organisations represent the communities that they serve and many communities and many organisations, that is not a reality. So people, you know, if you're trying to, and it's very clear because the evidence shows that the, the barometer of a, a really good and well-performing organisation is the satisfaction of its ethnic community workforce. So I still can't understand why organisations aren't really chomping at the bit to ensure that that happens, and they don't. But that, so if you care, 
and you're really committed to caring for your patients, then it's really incumbent that the, pay, that the staff that are delivering that care are nurtured, they feel loved, well taken care of, educated, supported and developed. And so if you don't get that right, then that ha has a direct deleterious impact on your, your patient population. So it's about levelling the play field and it's about having the courage, organisations having the courage to accept that racial discrimination exists and then what, then what are the actions that they're going to do to change it. My vision for the NHS, wow, that's a tall order. One of the things is that the NHS should be allowed to run itself. So we have a recent gover government white paper that has proposed that the government has a much more, um, if you like, control, uh, control mandate for the NHS. So one of the key things for me is that that doesn't happen and that the NHS governs itself. So it has the freedom to do uh, what it needs to do and respond to uh, local local changes. Secondly, is to address the inequalities. So that's a, that's a really big feature for me because the pandemic has just revealed all those existing inequalities and amplified them. And we've seen that in the way that um, COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted um, ethnic communities. So there needs to be a real addressing of the health inequalities. I say that for ethnic communities, but for also other communities. I would like to see that um, that there is a real focus. Uh, well, actually, there has been a fantastic focus on health and well-being, but I want to see that uh, across the whole healthcare landscape, so that we reduce the variation. So that if you're in a particular part of the country, that you you have the same standard of health provision as you would, for example, in London. I would like to see um, the issue of, uh, uh, of career progression uh, for everybody addressed. And I'd like to see organisations being really bold and, uh, bold and courageous about addressing those inequalities. Um, I, th I think it's absolutely paramount. I would also like to see that the NHS is prepared for when we have global emergencies that, that we've just done and that there's an upregulation um, of um, the required response that's needed. So, 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 so I'll, I'd like a, a fairer NHS. I'd like to see that. Why is it that if you are a black or Asian mother, you are five or six times likely to die um, from uh, perinatal complications and uh, neonatal deaths because you're black and Asian? I think that those statistics are totally unacceptable when you when you um, compare when you do like for like in terms of social class it's still poor and we need to make a real real impact in those kind of statistics so the issue of harm for me needs to be up front and center um, into in, into the way the NHS functions and also uh, around the NHS is to make sure that it works with the other agencies that are outside of the NHS as well. Mm -hmm.